Welcome to another episode of Authorization in Software, where we dive deep into tooling, standards, and best practices for software authorization. My name is Damien Schenkelman, and today we're diving deep into the Open Policy Authorization Layer, aka OPAL, with Gabriel Manol, Head of DevRel and Growth at Permit.io. Hey, Gabriel. It's great to have you here. Hey, Damien. That's actually great to be here. Super excited to speak about authorization as every day. <laughs> Yeah, that, I, I always look forward to chatting with folks that, that do this kind of like, let's say, for the living. Um, could you give our listeners a bit of overview of your background so they learn more about like, who, who was our guest today? Definitely. So my name is Gabriel, and uh, for the last, I'm not counting years anymore. I'm doing software engineering. What I'm counting is my uh, years in authorization, particularly, uh, particularly authorization in the field of access control. So in 2015, I started to work at Cisco in a product called Cisco ICE, which is like a server to authenticate an authorized user to the network, which is kind of something which is rare today because today we're using zero trust. So we authenticate an authorized user in application instead of in the network. But that was a thing there. I worked there for five years. Then I moved to Palo Alto Network, also work around security operation control rooms. And then most of the stuff was about broken access control. And for the last couple of months, I'm working at Permit.io, a startup that bring authorization for application developers as a service, which is a trend that uh, growing now. Um, but now I'm doing it from the go-to-market perspective. I'm the dev there, so I have like uh, the feeling of the user. And I'm really happy to help actually developers implement better access control and particularly authorization into their application. How did you go from those positions where like, again, there were hands-on to kind of like a startup and doing head of growth dev red? How did that transition happen? So... Um, let's say from 2018, uh, when I was back in Cisco, I participated in Hackathon. And this is when we started to see everything regards zero trust. So we have like huge customers doing network auth and they have like uh, thousands of switches that deploys in many sites and all the authorization, all the authentication was like with network credentials. But then they are like started to use the cloud. I mean, it sounds late, but this is how things happened in Cisco and huge enterprises. They started to use cloud and then they come and say, hey, I need to authorize my user based on cloud data, maybe even serverless stuff. And we don't have a way to do it because we like a server that sit together with network equipment. So my idea was let's create like cloud extensions for authorization. So uh, when we do authorization decision, instead of just doing it in the local setup of the authorization server, we can go to the cloud. So I developed something like this in the hackathon and then it was a huge success. And then I promoted to do a technical leadership in CTO officer. And this is where I started to meet users, right? So um, from since then, I'm not working on traditional R&D teams. I'm working more on CTO officers, and you know like more innovation teams and uh for me the next step was like do more the business do more the pm and devrel is like the nature place for me currently because i can start every week a new software project i can see tons of types of architectures and deployments and even experience code and also experience the uh, this manner of you know go to market and do the business stuff that's that's very interesting. Very interesting journey, and it it all started from kind of like starting to take authorization logic away from the networking layer and and back into kind of like the the application layer, not not relying on on the network and network membership to make authorization decisions, which is a typical thing. That as you say, as you move to the cloud, you start seeing. But again, some enterprises don't do it, or not all components do it, and it takes a while. For, for these things to happen. The, the topic of today is OPAL, the Open Policy Authorization Layer. And I thought that, again, that's a good start because kind of like it, it leads us in that direction, right? What, what's a technique that you can use 
to extract authorization logic from different components into a set of uh, policies and then deploy those in your code, make decisions based on software. Before we dive deep into, into Opal, I thought we can maybe do a high level overview of policies and, and attribute based access control. Uh, this is a topic that we discuss a lot on the podcast, but it's always good to kind of like do a quick refresher. So in your own words, uh, what's an authorization policy? How are they related to roles, uh, to attribute based access control? for people that maybe are new to this and aren't experts in the topic. Yeah, definitely. That, that's it. I, I always love to start, you know, with the basic, understand what we trying to account. And we'll get to it later, but I think this is, this is the, one of the most challenging uh, for developers that try to do authorization. So there is a whole topic of access control on our application, right? So we have application, we have their data, we have operation that we need to do on the data. We have a lot of stuff that, that can be done through our application. And then we control the access to the application. And we always like to stay in the comfort zone of authentication, only verify who our users is. But in the real world, we want also, you know, to maybe categorize the user. Some users can do something like this and some user can do something else and this is where policies come to place the most abstract manner of policies like a, a simple text sentence like is a monkey allowed to eat a banana right so we try to understand who is a monkey and we try to categorize the action that they can do like eating and then we have resources like banana and then we have a lot of policies that we try to implement. And by the way, this is the way I recommend uh, developers to start think about authorizations. Think in your own world. Define the policies in your own own world. And every application, of course, has a, like a different set of policies, but we need to streamline them, right? Software is a structured thing. And when we go to streamline, we go to policy models. Um, we spoke about, uh, you mentioned RBAC and ABAC. So RBAC, in my opinion, is the most common uh, permission model because that's the simplest one. We taking the users or the principals that do something in the application and we categorize them by roles. The most common one is like, let's say we have admins and we have standard users. And then we get a list of all the actions uh, or the operation that our users can do. And then the resources, let's say documents, pictures, uh, whatever it is. And then we create, we streamline the policies. So now it's not, is a monkey allowed to eat a banana? Is, is an animal allowed to eat food, right? And this is a way that we streamline our policy in a way that we can have better authorization, better permission in the application. When you, sorry, when you, sorry to interrupt, but I think this is an important word. When you say streamline, what do you mean? Is it in comparison to something else? So let's say when you do when you do write policies, like let's say in free language, right? You write always um, sentences or statements that sounds the same. There is a principal or user, there is action or operation, and there is resource. Okay, and um, when you when you implement it in software when you want to have policy rules that actually software can use it, you need to streamline each of the uh, principles into something that software can understand, right? So the easiest way to do it is using roles and type, types of resources, because this is something we can configure. We can configure roles for our users. We can say this user are admins, this user are managers, this user are just users. And we can categorize resources because this is our data structure, right? We have a database, no matter if SQL, no SQL, all the data is structured in resource type, right? So we have like document. And this is why when we modeling, okay, uh, uh, permissions, the easiest way to track and maintain is having the simplest categorization, roles and resource type, right? And this is actually where all developers start. They do RBAC. So the term, the most common term in authorization is let implement RBAC, let do RBAC, when we will support RBAC, right? This is the most common model. In the real world, that's not enough. So let's say, for example, we have a lot of work to assign roles to the users, but then we have more uh, um, 
but then we have more aspects. So let's say we have paid tiers. So our users are admins, but we have premium admins and we have standard admins. And sometimes we need to make decisions based on maybe geolocation, maybe the first letter on their name. And also in the resources, it's not enough to have only resource type because we have like sensitive document and then we have document. And if we are trying to keep strict RBAC all the way, then we need to create a whole, let's say, database table that just to keep a, a special type of data for authorization. So uh, then we go ABAC, attribute based access control. Instead of streamlining our policy in roles as categories and resource type as categories, we are looking deeper on the principles. We are looking at the user attributes. We are looking at the resource attributes. And then we write our policy in, our, in, in attributes manner, right? So if we, again, speaking about monkey and banana, we can see animal from species and food from species by the attribute. So we can say it could be like a uh, yellow food because we know the, the attribute is there. Yeah, that's an interesting thing you mentioned in terms of evolution. As the application, as the users get more sophisticated, you start needing to do more granular things. And that's where something like role-based access control, where you have a few roles and, and very coarse grain actions that they can take on, on resources or even categories of resources might not be enough. And as you need more to, to go more granular, policies become a, a viable option for, for that granular authorization uh, decision-making. The, the thing I wanted to ask is, What's the typical evolution in this path that an application follows, right? I guess not everyone starts using policies. So when do they decide to start using them? How do they take a call base and adapt it to use policies? And what challenges do you see teams face when they start doing that? From what I see, the first mistake happen on team when they start to kind of design authorization, they are falling into the implementation details of the particular language or framework that they are using. And specifically the term RBAC. So one of the things that I dislike in authorization, I, I don't want to use that word because RBAC is great and I particularly, I, I'm probably using it for a lot of stuff. But the way that development teams, instead of implementing authorization or defining permissions, they are look at the framework they use. Let's say they use FastAPI or ExpressJS, and then they are look on the RBAC framework that giving them the basic functionality they need, and they implementing it. And a week or a month or a year after, they understand that it's just not standing. And the reason could be a lot of reasons, but the main reason is bugs. And the bugs usually happen when policies start to be mixed with the code. So you started with the framework and probably our audience is developers. So let's uh, talk about the most common way of RBAC framework. It has like uh, decorators or annotators or an uh, API endpoint that declare the role that actually allowed to get into this endpoint. Right, and this is actually really simple. But then someone needs something that considered ABAC or they need like multiple roles or they need to get a decision in the middle of the uh, endpoint itself. And then they start to create like if statement that mixed with the code. And then someone get access to somewhere they not should get to. And when they look at the code, they see this code, usually the problem not started with the framework because the framework has to, aims to be simple. The complex start when they are understanding that instead of writing application, they are writing uh, permissions. And then they try to decouple policies from code. And there is some approaches today to decouple policies of code. One of, the, one of, uh, one of them is the one that we are going to speak a lot about today, policy as code, declaring policy rules instead of imperating imperative coding them inside the application, declare them out of the application and only get decisions based on them or only enforce the uh, authorization based on them in the application. But there is also some approaches like, and we can expand on it later, like policies graph or maybe policy that modeled on databases, which is a kind of narrow thing, but we saw uh, some implementation of it. So after they are doing like the mistake of 
implementation details of instead of designing permissions, they are moving to policy as code. Policy as code, uh, the main benefit again is the decoupling of policy from code. So now the company can have one place uh, where all the policy declared. And if I want to see the configuration, I, I know that instead of just guessing what happened in the application code, I can go to the policies code, right? To the declaration of the policy and understand what is the permission. And also when I need to manage it, I have one place to do it. And when I need version it, I can couple and decouple it from the application release cycle. So in one hand, they can version my policy configuration because now it's code and I can use like Git or other version control tools. But in the other end, I'm not depend on application release cycle. So let's say if I release a new feature, I not must couple the policy configuration to it, but and I can like change the policy just in time without deliver a new policy code. That also helped them then to scale for testing the policy themselves and then focusing the application only in the enforcement, right? So the way that we are enforcing feature on the application, that way, the way that we are not allowing user with particular attribute to access to document with particular attribute, the way that we enforce it, not related to the way that we actually declare it, right? The declaration and the decision in one thing and the feature that enforce it is something that should be decoupled from it. And this is where we see the um, exponential growth of policy as code in applications. So after they do the mistake, after it is suffered of authorization that coupled together with the application code, they move to more mature models like policy as code and then declaring policies and manage them separately of the application itself. That makes sense. I like how you went from, you start with doing the authorization in your framework, which typically is you get a role or something in the token, like maybe it's a JWT that comes into the endpoint that you take the scopes from it and, and then you use some logic to, to match that with what you can do or not with the endpoint. But over time that doesn't scale. And as you say, if you need to apply authorization decisions at some other points in your code base that you don't kind of like have that um, middleware to make that decision. So you start extracting this authorization logic into policies and it makes sense because you, you deduplicate it and, it and it's in one place. But there are a couple of things to unpack here, right? On the other, on the one hand, these policies need to be written in a language and, and that's kind of like a new thing for developers to learn. And then this language needs a, a runtime or, or some way in which like you can run programs written in that language to get to authorization decisions. How, how does that typically work? Yeah. So the way that policies code work has two essential components. One is the language itself. And the second is, let's say, the runtime, right? So we need to run this language somewhere. Um, the runtime usually refers as a policy engine, right? An engine that can get decisions. The policy itself is like the configuration for this runtime. So if we take like uh, an example of a bug policy, okay? We think that a user, um, a paid user, right? It has an attribute that they are a paid user is allowed to create a um, document with an attribute of rich text. Okay, let's say that we allowed only paid users to create rich text documents. And then the way that we model it traditionally, we already explained why it's hard, but what if we can declare it in a very strict way? So let's think, for example, let, let's speak, for example, on CDR, the policy language that um, crafted by AWS now and uh, released as open source. So instead of uh, modeling it in database, we are declaring a statement. This statement said, permit, okay, let's uh, think about it like a function, permit that get three argument, user, action, and resource. And then we can declare which of the attributes of those principles are actually permitted. Right, so we say we're declaring like a function that call permit with the relevant argument to the policy we want to declare, and etc. And then we have the runtime. The runtime know to get this declaration, and then you can query the the runtime with the data. So I'm 
passing the runtime uh, um, the argument and by the declaration the runtime get a decision if a permission is allowed or not allowed this way we don't need to model our data we can for example uh, decouple the state of the data and the way that we are modeling the data in the application from what we need in the policy config uh, i see what you're saying where again you, you have the language um, and you have this kind of like policy files um, and you need to version them you need to learn how to write in that language for example you mentioned cedar which means that as a developer instead of writing javascript in my JS application in my Node.js application, I need to figure out how to write CDAR. I need to also figure out a way to communicate with this runtime that's making these authorization decisions via either uh, inter-process communication, if it's available, if it's in another machine, I need to do it via like in some networking protocol. It seems that we're going from a world where the challenges the developer has are at the kind of like authorization logic level figuring out who has access to what, and we're moving them somewhere else, more at the operational level, and, and also kind of like the knowledge level, right? I need to learn a bunch of components, and then I need to operate them in order to get a solution to work. Yeah, that, that's correct. But when looking at that operation perspective, this is actually the way software goes today, right? So what we are trying to do is having developer uh, um, develop and deliver much more feature that important to our business logic. And the way we seeing, we seeing it happened everywhere is like having them uh, worry, let's call it worry, and then we explain how they not really need to worry for it, for the operations, because operations happened once. Coupling logic is something that actually break you to deliver new business functionality. Right. So if I need to create more bugs in, in my code and new code mean more bugs, if I need to couple it to my uh, release and cycles, that mean I don't deliver new functionality. But if at one point of time I need to spin up a new service, I need to set up a new service that mean uh, uh, for the long term, it will be much easier for me to maintain the configuration. Correct, it's not the language that I'm writing code today, but who writing one language today, right? Developers are polyglot. I myself coding in Golang and JavaScript all the time. And all the friends that I know as developers, they are not like Java developer anymore or JavaScript developers anymore, right? We are kind of polyglot. And the worry of a new language, that the less worry I'm worrying about. Uh, particularly because it's a very simple languages and something that everyone can implement, but the benefits it brings in separating the concern of uh, getting authorization decision and the way that you manage it in a different life cycle that help you deliver safely uh, business value to the product while you maintain great access control in the other end, that's a benefit that, in my opinion, worth it. I think there's a trade-off here, right? And, and it's important to know that there's a trade-off. I, I do still think that it's it's a good trade-off to make. Like, I think in general, eventually, if I was kind of like figuring out how to build one of these apps, I would need to figure out how to decouple authorization from my core logic. Again, especially if, as things scale, as I have more teams working on things and, and as things need to be audited and there's compliance and security needs and so on. But this is important, right? Like you are adding pieces to a potentially distributed system and you are having people learn that they need expertise in a language that ultimately is going to be used to make authorization decisions, which means that they need to be competent enough to know that the policies that they're putting in place actually do what they want them to do for all possible inputs. And, and again, that, that's definitely a challenge that, that's worth considering. Now, with all that being said, I know that there's a set of tools that helps with some of these challenges of, of managing these policies, of making sure that kind of like operations and, and like the policy deployment works and the versioning. Um, I know there's uh, Amazon Verify permissions for like CDAR, which you mentioned earlier, there's Tyradas and Opal for OPA. Uh, what's this kind of like category of solutions and what does it help teams building with policies do? Yeah. So, as we mentioned, there is like the operation trade-off. And this is where those tools trying to get in, uh, to come into the picture, 
and solve this operational problem. So I, I do have the components, right? I do have the language and the file where I store the policy. I do have the policy engines, but now I left with the operational part of, you know, deploying those engines, managing the versioning of the policy configuration. And one thing that we haven't spoke about before is the data itself, right? When I getting a policy decision, when I get authorization decision, there is data that need to take into consideration. Let's say the attribute of the users, the attribute of the resources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you mentioned three tools and three tools, and that's actually great because each one of them is kind of uh, representing a different trend in this policy, uh, policies called trends. Amazon Verified Permissions is a tool that offered by a cloud provider to be uh, uh, for developers that, you know, based their application on AWS and they want to get uh, this deployment of policy architecture together with their application. So AWS like offering a service that help you deploy and manage policy engines together with your uh, uh, CDAR policies that you configure in AWS itself. And that's actually a great solution for uh, AWS, call it AWS developers that are trying to add uh, policies code authorization into application. Styra does in the other end is very, very focused on the infrastructure side, which we don't met, mentioned much here, but authorization also has an aspect in service to service communication, right? Which microservice can get to which microservice and why and in what conditions, etc. So this is a, where Styra does comes into the place as a solution, particularly for cloud native architectures where developer want to manage uh, that mission and infrastructure stage of uh, authorization. It helped them uh, to manage the data. It helped them to manage the policy configuration and it helped them to manage the deployment of the um, uh, policy engines. Opal is an open source tool that uh, the main benefit you can get from it is um, the independencies of policy engine of policy technology. You mentioned that uh, um, we have a challenge, the challenge of learning new things, the challenge of learning new language, maybe learning new models. And this challenge is actually growing because at some point, some developers understand that the language that they use, the policy engine that they use is actually not fit into their product. And we can get to it later, but Policy languages are different from each other, not only in the how the language look like, but in what kind of policy they can handle and regarding, let's say, latency and so on and so forth. So Opal is an open source tool that help you first managing all the policy engines, but you're not limited to one policy engine like uh, um, Open Policy Agent or CDAR Core or whatever policy engine in it. And you also not limited with the kind of the policies coders you're using. So you can use Cedar for something and you can use Rigo, which is the language of poly open policy agent on for something else or whatever language you want. So Opal is very pluggable for everything related to policy config, to policy engine, but not less important, it also pluggable for the data that you need to get the policy decision. So looking at the other tools, um, verified permission is very close to the data that you hold in AWS, to all the architecture that you manage your data in AWS. Styra DAS is more for infrastructure level. Application has many, many data sources. This is one of the things that we see growing that if we think like even five or six years uh, earlier, application has one database. This is where my data was uh, uh, all the time. One of the things before the NoSQL hype was the term of one source of truth. Today, we don't have one source of truth. We have data everywhere. We have data in multiple types of database of our application. We have data that you consume directly from other cloud services. And Opal is a plugin system that help you manage all the data you need for policy, um, uh, policy decisions in one place. So think about it like a tool and we can dive later for the architecture itself and how it works. 
But think about it like a tool that with single lines of configuration code, like uh, um, Helm charts or Docker, uh, Docker Compose um, configuration, spin up a whole authorization system that can be pluggable into any kind of policy config, any kind of uh, policy engine, and any kind of data that you need to get this decision. So all the operation uh, trade-off of spinning up engines, connecting your data, is actually happened once in a very cloud-native way. I get what you're saying. So you're, you're saying Opal abstracts a couple of things. On the one hand, it, it helps abstract operations, takes care of, of it so that in, if you're in a cloud-native environment, in Kubernetes, the agents are available, data is made available to them as well. But on the other hand, it also abstracts the runtime. So if you're using uh, CDAR policies or if you're using Rigo policies, Opal does not care. Maybe we can kind of like go a bit backwards in time and and, feed and and start from like, what's the history of Opal? How did it get started and, and how did it go down this road? How did it make these decisions? Yeah. So Opal actually started when all Vice and Safcoin permit founders created a company. So they decided to do like authorization as a service for application. And the right thing to do was, of course, based on policy as code. So if you want to do like something as a service, the best practice is to do what you will recommend your users. So they choose back then, it was like uh, almost two years ago, they choose back then to use Open Policy Agent. But as I mentioned, Open Policy Agent is very oriented for infrastructure level authorization. And when you need to uh, stand in a velocity of application, in the speed of syncing policy configuration, in fetching data from multiple endpoints, in scaling your decision point everywhere, that's where uh, uh, Open Policy Agent lacks. So they decided to create like administration layer for Open Policy Agent that will help them to sync all the policies. Then the data is grow and they understood that they need more types of policies. So specifically, they were need in implementation of Google Zanzibar. We haven't mentioned Google Zanzibar yet. We can uh, go back to it later, but that's actually another type of policy implementation. And then they need to add to the software that they worked support in another, let's say, policy system. And they, they then they edit and then they saw like they build a tool that can potentially help a lot of developers out there that want to move to policies code, policies graph, not policy that imperative in application code to manage their uh, authorization workload. And then they decided to uh, release Opal to be an open source. And uh, instead of, you know, developing what's right for permit, which yeah, everyone that, you know, develop commercial software know that um, limit yourself for your need. It's something that can uh, um, cost later. So they decided to open source and see the community that already deal, the part of the community that already deal with the complexity of managing policy as code uh, to add support in more engines. And this is actually what we see. We see the community adopt it. We see that like uh, uh, more and more contribution coming in. It seems it started with like, the notion of eating your own dog food, right? I, I have a problem. I need to solve it. I'm also in your case, you were not just working on, on your internal way of, of managing these policies, but also solving authorization externally. What's what's the story here and like how, how it's deployed, right? Like maybe uh, at Permit, how it started and then how can people deploy Opal in the wild? Is it just for cloud native environments? Can I deploy it if I'm running a few machines on, on GCP or EC2? Like how does it work? Yeah. So... Opal as a nice server and client architecture is not aimed to be cloud native. It could sit everywhere and it could actually fit to every kind of modern application. The server responsibility, and we already mentioned the component of the modern policy uh, system, the server responsibility is for uh, the policy configuration. So the server is like a GitOps enabled tools that can be connected to a uh, um, Git configuration to policy configuration as code uh, 
and make sure it always synced. All the versioning is in place. It also has like architecture to connect it to API bundle. So the servers, think about it like the, the, the control plane part that's responsible for the policy configuration and for the, let's say, data configuration. The client is, in the other hand, the data plane side. So it's like uh, containers that you can scale wherever you want. So you mentioned like you have few machines on GCP, you can run each client as a sidecar to each machine, or you can run it as a sidecar for your pods or in Kubernetes. So whatever it is, the client is, think about it like, not a real, but kind of stateless uh, containers that wrapping the policy engines, and again, no matter what the policy engines it is, wrapping it in a abstraction layer for getting decision. And with engines, we call them data features that know to keep the data always sync with the decision making. And it also, of course, connected for this to the server. So the server know how to scale them and the server also know to sync all the policy with those clients. Um, so for now, you can actually just take Opal, deploy it on your environment, okay? And you can plug the policy engines to it. So for now, uh, Opal already support Open Policy Agent and uh, uh, Cedar Agent because this is actually what, what we see the real need um, for the market currently, but we really looking for the community, you know, to add support on their one. I can say from permit perspective that we we develop the support of the engine and release them open source as we need them. This is actually uh, the reason we lately release support in Cedar agent. I was going to, to ask about that. We did an episode in, in this season, season two, of the podcast with um, Emina from from the CDAR team, we talked about how they kind of like open sources. This was early May, 2023. Why did the the Opal team decide to add CDAR support? What what were you seeing? So th that's actually a great question because there are policy engines out there, right? And as permit, we are kind of uh, um, our engine. <laughs> kidding you, right? Our internal engine is add support from what we believe the market will adopt, right? Um, we do have our internal, let's say, commercial implementation of the custom thing we do with Opal. Uh, when we think of something to be released as open source, is because the trend we see coming, the hype we see coming. When a tech giant like AWS come and say to developers, look, people, you need to stop using imperative policy code in your application. You need to move into a declarative policy as code way. This is something we feel Opal need to support, right? So we want to demonstrate how Opal as an open source tool can make developers polyglot. And for in our perspective, this is actually like a, a, a flow of users that decided to do policy as code started with, let's say, Rigo because it was great for infrastructure. And now they are looking for more application level uh, uh, policy language. The nature move will be to Cedar. Uh, there are, there are like application level policy languages out there, but none of them came as a result of a, a company of a cloud provider that actually knows how application developer work. And this is why we feel like the, the nature addition to Opal as an administration layer for application level policy, particularly to support in this language. That, that makes sense. It seems it's both a decision to allow flexibility and, and choice, but also kind of like a more, I would say, quote, kind of like strategic bet on, hey, like if AWS is pushing for this, a few folks might become experts in this. We, we should have support in it for the, the open source project. And, and it also helps exercise that abstraction layer for the runtime on the language, I guess, right? Correct. So when AWS, we were like uh, partners, we, we partnered with AWS even before they release it. Uh, we get kind of early access to the code and to the product. And we actually also released an open source project called Cedar Agent. 
which is like the equivalent for uh, CEDAR, but uh, for open policy agents. So CEDAR itself is actually a Rust package. And when you want to do like a abstract API calls to it, you need to run like a piece of Rust code. We created an open source project called CEDAR agent that actually uh, let developer run the, the abstracted engine of CEDAR. And hence, uh, Opal can use it too. Uh, that makes sense. And I mean, it's always nice to kind of like partner when, when doing some of these launches to gauge how the, the open source community will, will use some of these components and, and figure out like how, how everything works. Let's, let's go kind of like at a higher level. Who is using Opal today and, and what are, are you seeing it being used for? So that, that's a good question because I have names that I'm really impressed of that use OPA. I can mention like uh, Tesla, Microsoft, NBA, Accenture, Zapier, like really good uh, um, software organizations that using actually Opal. And one of the things that I like them to see doing with Opal is the use cases. So you see like a large organization that decided to streamline their infrastructure policy or their IT policies, which is like, let's say, and all the domain of uh, policy configuration. And then when they try to take it to a modern environment, they tackle the scaling. So they started to use OPA, Opal, yeah. Or for example, you can see organization that decided to go with, let's say like uh, um, open policy agent itself. And then they understood that the data cost a lot in open policy agent and they need a better way to f to manage the data that open policy agent used and then they started to use opal so the way of using opal is for me and the reason i'm so enjoying an opal is that we see that we are really solving as challenges when users go to scale so the, the saying that opal is the administration layer that help us help you scale policies code is something that we see almost in every uh, organization or developer that start using it. And what challenges or, or maybe gotchas, mistakes are you seeing from some of these teams when they start to, to implement Opal? Maybe one or two things that listeners can say, oh, I, I should avoid these. That's a question that uh, it's connect me to the point that we spoke before, uh, like a new learning curve that need to made for policy as code. One of the common gotcha is the mistaking, uh, mistakes that users do regarding control plane and data plane, right? So for example, they are mixing uh, um, configuration that should came as a pure data in the policy config. And then they are getting harder to deliver policy on time, right? So instead of configuring abstract policies and let the data on real time uh, um, um, being proce processed by the policy engine, they are kind of declaring the data on the policy itself. And this is kind of learning curve that in general in policy as code, uh, uh, developers need to, to uh, uh, train for how I think about policy as configuration and decision as the data plane itself that need to be done. I, I get what you're saying. Could you maybe provide an example so it's clear in, in people's head, uh, particularly if think if someone hasn't ever written a policy and, and kind of like fed data to it? Exactly. So one of the things that specifically uh, open policy agent support is actually doing stuff during the policy running, let's say do a network call. Okay. And this actually taking a time, time means the decision uh, it could take longer. When you do uh, the right thing, I I'm not saying that you should never do a policy call as part of your decision making, but uh, um, sorry, the RPC call while you do decision making. But the point is when you manage it right, you want to take this data at the right uh, at the point of time that is relevant right so users kind of uh, uh, making their policy decisions take a long time and then they come and say hey we see that the decision taking like two or three seconds and we want to get sub 10 milliseconds and then by a 
Simple rethinking of the policy itself as the more abstraction level of policy declaration, right? So instead of modeling the data inside the policy or trying to get this data as part of the policy, they are now separating the concern between the control plane, the policy uh, uh, configuration itself, and the data itself that happened in the data plane. When I get a decision, they get the right uh, time for decision. I see what you mean. In, in that case, that example would mean try to think about the policy just from a data perspective, regardless of, of its location, and don't think about how to get that data into the policy layer, like kind of like delegate that to, to another component. Is that what you're going for? Yeah. So specifically in Opal, you can configure data features right and the data feature opal is a like smart mechanism how to manage the data that the decision makers save right so let's say for example you have like a billing system and you want to know now that the user paid for something so instead of doing it as part of the policy configuration so configure the policy to do some call you're doing it as part of your data feature so when the policy engine need to get a decision the policy itself is very abstract. Is that a paid users or non-paid users? And then the data layer, this is the, data, this is the layer that actually knows how to manage this slice of data, how to manage this connection of data, right? So we see that, for example, that, uh, uh, again, we can get to it later, but uh, let's say graph-based policy. So we want to get decision based on relationship between entities, right? And this requires a lot of data to be in the policy layer themselves because we, we want to know the connection, the, the relationship between entities. And then people try to declare it the policy itself. Okay, So they say, like, go to some endpoint, check for relationship and stuff like that. And then they are uh, uh, losing the world of getting policy fast and keeping the right data in the other end. Um, so this way of thinking that we are now declaring and configuring code while the decision itself happen in real time and need to get the right the right data independently of what happened in the policy configuration that a way of thinking that we see a lot of glitches in. it it seems the things that you're mentioning allude to the fact that authorization decisions or at least Teams and and, pro, and and users want authorization decisions to be fast because an authorization decision happens when whenever you're interacting with an application. It's 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 for yeah exactly it's for for every let's say request or, or every like if the, there might be multiple per request and like it usually happens in distributed systems. It seems state and managing state required for these authorization decisions is a big part of it, right? So. If, if I'm running a policy, for example, and the policy takes two milliseconds, but before I run the policy, I need to go fetch data from a database and that call takes half a second, then even if the policy is very fast itself, the authorization decision as a whole might be slow. And, and this is where kind of like, again, the notion of, of a fetcher comes in. So like, how does, let, let, let's start there maybe like, what problems were you seeing in the wild and, and how does Opal help to manage this state? So w one of the things that we see uh, is speaking about problems. Um, and I, I want to start from um, expanding this landscape of problems. OK, so when we configure policies code, right, we have like configuration that let's speak about very, let's say, very complex ABAC configuration. We want to get a decision based on uh, uh, conditions on three or four attributes of the users, right? So let's say what the account age is large than 100 days and uh, they, they live in Europe and they are, for example, paid user in a particular tier and so on and so forth. And then we also want to have a lot of uh, um, um, decision making on the resource itself so it should be document that's stored there and belongs to there and etc etc so we have like a big policy 
To make this uh, uh, big policy, um, complex policy, to run fast, we need to have, let's call it, small chunk of data, right? The more data, the more data fetching, the more data processing, the more data handling that we will need to have when we get a decision, make this policy decision longer, right? And you can see it actually in policy engines that based on policy as code, and let's call it like the stateless policy as code, when they are, when they are getting a lot of data, they start to get decision slow, right? This is, this is how that happened. And one of the things in Opal that actually even differentiated from other abstraction layers, other administration layers of uh, policy engines is the data feature architecture. The data feature architecture is first pluggable. You can plug in any kind of data feature. So think about it like fetching HTTP data, fetching gRPC data, fetching Postgres database data, fetching whatever data that you need to fetch. You can write a plugin that do the right thing for you, right? So you mentioned before, not in this context, but you mentioned before like the connectivity between stuff. So you can in the data fetcher have like data fetcher for one client, one engine that can go to some data source and another client that can go to another data source. Okay, so you can plug and play this configuration of data fetching for each client. That first help you to make sure that your client get the real data that they need. On top of that, Opal has a nice slicing and eventually consistent mechanism to make sure that only the data that the client need, only the data that you configured is getting actually into the policy engines. And not only that, it has, uh, as I mentioned, eventually consistent uh, uh, mechanism that the policy engine could know that now something changed. And then I have policy to decide. I can say I deny everything until something changed. I can say I can trust on the previous configuration until something changed. But for sure, I know that something changed now. And then Opal actually helping you in scaling the fast of these policy decisions. So if in, let's say, uh, I, I'm saying traditionally, it's not traditionally, right? It's all a new topic. But let's say if, if let's say in a traditionally policy agent, you need to fetch the whole data because this is the way you should work. Opal is actually with the data fetcher architecture, let you a very sophisticated way to manage the state that your data needs to get now. So you're not only configure the policy itself, you not only configure the way you declare your policy, you also configure the way that they are consuming data. And this is one of the things that Opal itself, uh, even it is not a policy engine, helping you get policy decisions much faster. It seems then that there are a couple of things here. The data fetcher allows you to connect to different components, get data before a policy actually runs and, and there's probably something there like how does it know what data to fetch before the authorization decision needs to be made so and, and maybe we can dig into that and then there's another part which is it also has a mechanism or at least maybe you have to implement mechanisms by which you can check if data has become stale or data has changed so that policies can become aware of that maybe there's a hey is this data recent or not and give kind of like an escape hatch. Hey, if this data has changed since the last update on kind of like, I guess, the, an in-memory cache or something like that, then go down this route and maybe deny decisions until we have the latest. Um, how does the fetcher know what data to fetch and what data not to fetch? Because ultimately, I guess here there are kind of like cost th reasons around like minimizing networking costs and and not doing kind of like unnecessary things, particularly if you're going to external data sources, right? Like if you're running on a cloud provider and you need to go fetch data from, from somewhere else that might cost you a bit. There are in memory, like resource reasons, like you, 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 otherwise you're going to have your agent take up lots of resources, depending on the data structures that you use, your local searches might be slower. How does all of that work? Yeah, so that's actually actually connected in my mind to the previous question about gotchas. Uh, 
Uh, when speaking about data, there is, as you kind of mentioned, baseline data, data that actually our application based on, let's say resource type, something that almost never happened, uh, almost never changed. And there is data like, say, real-time data. And Opal is actually let you separate that. So you have like baseline data, which is the data that you load your clients with it. But there is even a level of granularity on it because you can actually load different clients with different uh, baseline of data, right? So for example, if you, you have like a, um, a microservice architecture, you can design that uh, different engines on different microservices has different sets of baseline data. And this way you make sure that each one get the slice of the right data that they can get the right, they can get the right decisions based on. On top of baseline data, you have real-time data. And here again, you have this granularity, you have kind of data feature and a different, uh, let's say you can use polling, you can use uh, uh, like uh, pushing, you can use like uh, bidirectional RPCs. Everything is actually configured in the data feature level, in configuration of the data feature level, and in the configuration of the deployment. And in this way, you can make sure that the right policy engines, the right clients that run policy agent for a purpose, for a microservice, for the whole system, is run only with the right data that they need at one point of time. As I, as I hear this, it makes sense. I also think that it seems that as a team or as a company using Opal, this is where I would spend a lot of my time, right? Like fine tuning these fetchers, making sure, sure they, they work the right way. Does Opal come with some set of like default fetchers or like already available fetchers for generic providers or maybe like very common providers? And then I might have to do some things for, for anything that's specific to, to my team, my company. Yeah, so definitely Opal comes with fetchers that we develop ourselves, like I mentioned, HTTP features, but some community members that, as you mentioned, spend the time to write their own feature that contribute them back to the community. So NBA, for example, uh, um, release a feature for Cosmos DB, a DB that stands for um, uh, making a policy decision. And uh, for example, we have like a community member that contribute Postgres feature. Um, since this is a pluggable system and that's correct that all of our, actually our, let's say large Opal users are actually writing a very specific data feature from the reason I mentioned, right? To the reason you mentioned to make the policy uh, decisions faster, but some of them in that just contributed back. So I, I I can't remember now the whole data feature that we already have, but the Opal uh, um, Opal repository on GitHub has a list of all the features and integrations that already uh, contributed back for, from the community. It's uh, nice to mention here that kind of integrations and third-party support like pluggable stuff is not only on the data feature side. So we have like a, a Git bundles that you can implement yourself we have like a way to uh, write plugins, as we mentioned, for policy engine themselves. So Opal is actually a very pluggable system. And we really see the community that contribute back the things that important to them in this plugin system of Opal. That makes sense. So that's one of the benefits of the open source approach and, and the plug out system, right? It's like you, you get to benefit from, from others. One thing you, you alluded to earlier and, and you mentioned a couple of times was this notion of like relationship-based or, or graph-based authorization decisions. Um, you talked about kind of like the notion of Sanzibar, which you know, I worked on a system that, that's based on it. We had a couple of episodes of, about the topic last season, which, which we're going to link on the show notes. Can you maybe expand of, of where that fits in? Because it seems at least, again, we're talking about Opal, we're talking about state this would be a good moment to, to explain some of that. So I, I'm happy that you come with that question because 
Personally, for the last couple of months, I really want to have support in one you mentioned, relationship-based uh, uh, engines to Opal. Uh, but I want first, you know, like we had an explanation on RBAC and ABAC, explain what is this relation-based uh, uh, authorization and why it's kind of different from RBAC and ABAC. So relationship-based authorization is something that is very common in consumer applications. So let's say when you are, let's say, uh, a social network, you can see all your posts, you can see posts of your friends, you can see posts of gr groups that you are a member of, and it's getting very complex when you have like layers. So I am, for example, a member of organization that is a member of organization, a member of organization, and by my belonging to this very low level organization, I want to be able to perform operation on, let's say, like my my cousin in other organization because we are belong to uh, the same top organization. This is what called relationship based access control. And again, it's very common if you imagine like uh, one of the example that I like to bring is like uh, Google Drive, right? So you can share documents in a very granular way. Um, this relationship based access control is a very nice uh, um, a protocol or standard called Google Zanzibar and also nice implementation. In my opinion, and you also like mentioned it here, one of the best implementation for application level itself and for modern application, it's OpenFGA. It's actually implementation of a very good standard for relationship based access control um, that has the same maybe not the exact the same, but the ideas of policy engine, something that getting the decision, policy that configured as code, but it has also something that don't have in RBAC and ABAC. It has graph database that by looking on its node, you can get the decision, right? So relationship is something that could take time to calculate. So we want to keep state, we want to keep data. And this is the main differentiation between RBAC and ABAC and RIBAC. In RBAC and ABAC, in one hand, you don't need a lot of data. The decision itself happened based on a very specific set of data, but the policy can be very complex. As we mentioned, we could like combine 10 attributes in the user, 12 attributes in the resource and get a decision on it. But again, we don't need a lot of data. When we look on relationship-based access control, the policy rules in the nature are simple. If a user is belong to a kind of relationship, they are allowed. If not, they are not allowed. In the other end, the state that we manage, the data that we, we manage is uh, much higher and need to be in much scale than a, a policy agent that based on RBAC and ABAC, right? Uh, the nice thing about Opal is because the nature of open source and the understanding that at some point, at some point, and we we personally, I personally already seeing it now with some users, at some point, policies code will be polyglot. Developer will be polyglot. They will want, for example, to have one setup of OpenFGA for having a, a very granular or highly granular relationship-based decision, but for other need of the application, they will want to declare APAC policy to stand in very complex decisions very fast. And one of the things that I like with OPA, and I really like to see the hype around the community, is bringing OPA to a phase that we are actually supporting in one hand in policy engines and policy agent that are mostly stateless, use very specific slices of data and allowed complex policy in one hand and in the same setup, in the same policy server that actually kept everything sync and scale the policy client, support also a, a, poly, a relationship based policy that require a lot of data, require, require manage the state, but let you uh, get much sophisticated authorization decision based on relationship. Yeah, and, and I think that's at least ultimately how I think about this, where on the one hand, there is a space and a need for, for attribute-based access control and attribute-based decisions. On the other hand, there are cases where you need very fast authorization decisions 
uh, you don't want to deal with kind of like operational overhead of um, running all of these components. So like in having that state in, in the database makes sense. And, and, and that's where kind of like systems like OpenFGA or, or other Zanzibar implementations come in. Um, a couple of things for, for people that aren't familiar with it. So Google Zanzibar released a paper, uh, uh, sorry, Google released a paper called uh, Google Zanzibar, which is kind of like how Google does authorization internally, that kind of like Google Drive example uh, that you mentioned is a good one. And uh, as, as, as Gabriel was saying, uh, it's not a standard. It's kind of like maybe becoming sort of a, a community de facto standard because a few companies uh, have a few open source projects that are starting to kind of like follow in that those footsteps. Uh, maybe a comparison would be much like um, MapReduce and, and Hadoop happen kind of like from an, an open source perspective. Uh, and the other thing, as you were saying, is it uses the notion of, of a graph of these relationships between users and objects to make authorization decisions. But the key thing, and this is one thing that they call out in the paper and, and also a thing that, that's in most of the implementations that I've seen, is that it doesn't actually end up using a graph database behind it because of how the um, authorization model DSL, domain-specific language, works. You can actually implement those graph relationships and these very fast lookups on top of ordinary SQL databases, and, and that makes a lot of the kind of like operation and overhead a lot less, right? Like graph databases, I, I wouldn't say are new, kind of like they, they, they were a thing in the 80s, not, now they're back, but their operational properties are very different from things that maybe if you're used to running a Postgres or a MySQL or like a cloud database like Dynamo or Cosmos, etc. And that's a big thing, right? You don't have to run a database that you're not familiar with in order to run some of these open source projects. Yeah, exactly. So this is the way we're seeing it, and that's truly excitement for us. And we are truly eager to see how the um, community will adopt this idea of managing the polyglot policy setups. A couple of closing thoughts. I, I want to go back to how this all started, right, with Permit. Can you explain what Permit IO does and like why you folks ended up creating Opal for those that aren't familiar with Permit? Yeah, so Permit is actually uh, wrapping all the good things together, um, but also let you everything. So you mentioned all the operational costs, right? So at the end, I have to deploy the services. I have to maybe develop like audit and monitoring and scaling and maybe UI to edit all the policies and uh, um, whatever it is, Permit just bring it all in a nice cloud offer that user can subscribe. And one of the things that differentiate a uh, permit from, like, let's say, other cloud products that offer authorization of the service is the ability to scale. So you can um, take permit, connect it into your Git repository where you already store your policy as code and let permit scale everything for, for you, plus get all the you know external services like auditing, monitoring, uh, um, user management, uh, data fetching, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. So beside of being like a, let's call it standard cloud service for a, a authorization layer application, it also support all the operational headache that you could have from maintaining authorization system yourself as a cloud service. What I take away from that is if you want to use Opal, but not have to run it, Permit is kind of like Opal on steroids as a service. And I guess you can deploy it to your own cloud, not just kind of like the, the Permit cloud. Yeah, so Opal Opal is, uh, as we said, has a lot of scalability options, right? So we have like kind of Opal Plus offer, which is, you know, the more traditional uh, commercial open source. Permit itself is more for, as you said, uh, save you all the effort of scaling, deploying everything and get everything around it. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. Gabriel, it's, it's been a great conversation. We went deep into a number of topics. Uh, hopefully this gives listeners the, the opportunity to learn about some of the things that are happening in the space and trigger thoughts and, and kind of like help them figure out some things with like, hey, I should be using this. I should be checking that out and so on. Uh, it's been great to have you on the show, man. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Yeah, sure. That was really great. And I was happy to be here. And again, uh, I'm pretty sure you can show links. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn. I always really love to talk about policies, code, and create better access control experiences for application. Definitely. Yeah, we, we will add those links, your social links, some of the permit links to the show notes. We'll also share links to everything that we've been discussing today to the show notes so that people can easily find those there. It's been amazing to have you. And again, to everyone listening in, if, if you folks have uh, questions about permit or um, Opal itself, just feel free to kind of like ask Gabriel or go to some of the, those clicks. That's it for today's episode of Authorization in Software. Thanks for tuning in and listening to us. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform so you never miss an episode. And if you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, feel free to reach out to us on social media. We love hearing from our listeners. Keep building secure software, and we'll catch you on the next episode of Authorization in Software. Thank you.